Bob Bryan has been a friend of mine for many years. Uh, when I taught at Woodcrest College in East Texas, I remember I spoke at Cypress Valley Bible Church before it was Cypress Valley Bible Church. I think it was Believers Bible Church back then or something. And that was about 1985 or 6. So it seems like a while ago, but you've been there since 75, right? Must have been five years old when you started there. Anyway, Bob's a graduate of uh, Dallas Seminary. He, uh, he is someone like me that was mentored uh, by Zane Hodges, not only in seminary, but in the many years that uh, followed. And he's speaking on a topic that should be dear to all our hearts, and that is what, what sort of future do we look for with the Free Grace Movement? And he's got a rather audacious title, The Biblically Prophesied Future of the Free Grace Message, what does that mean? Well, we'll find out. Let's give him a warm welcome. Thank you. Audacious. It's audacious. Wow. Well, being scheduled to speak on Thursday, I've realized it's a great privilege because I get to speak to those who endure to the end. <laughs> and you know what Jesus said about those people. I'd like to begin, let's say get this remote here. God our Savior desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. Let's pray. Father, we want to just pause and think about your heart in this moment. We know, Father, that your heart breaks for the lost people of the world. You have a heart for unsaved people desiring that they hear the saving message and be saved and believe and be saved. Father, I pray that you would uh, give us just a, a measure of your heart this morning for the world and give us just a measure of your compassion and uh, passion to reach the world for Christ and give us uh, hope and expectation about what you're going to do in the future as a result of your love for the world. Give us that same love and show us what we might do in light of what your word tells us. Amen. From that verse, we can see that the free grace movement is very important to God. But God is faced with two problems in regard to his desire to see all men saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. First problem I want to picture in this uh, chart that you see of the population of the world. At the bottom you see the uh, timeline and then here is a measurement of billions of people. You may be like me and not have been aware of, the, of what we see on that chart. The world population did not grow hardly at all, relatively speaking, until the 1800s. In the 1800s, it began to take off. Uh, in the last 200 years, it's exploded. In the last 50 years, it's exploded in an unbelievable rate compared to the past history of the world. That's a sobering chart when we think of all these billions of people who need to hear the saving message. Uh, that leads to another problem. The other problem is that the gospel is under siege, to quote the title of a famous book, at least famous in this room. I believe when Zane put that title on the book, he was using the term gospel as equivalent to the saving message. And I'm aware that the gospel, the term gospel can be used in a broader sense, as Bob has uh, helped us to see even in a recent uh, GES newsletter. But... This morning I want to refer to the gospel in the sense that Zane titled the book, Gospel Meaning Saving Message. As it's expressed, for example, in John 6, 47, Jesus said, Most assuredly I say to you, he who believes in me has everlasting life. That message has been under siege for centuries. It's been that way since the first century. The Galatians are an example of those that turned away to a different gospel. And people have been turning away to a different gospel down through the centuries 
uh, starting, for example, in Arminian theology. Arminian theology teaches that God gives not everlasting life, he gives probationary life. That probationary life is gained through Christ plus works. You must live a life in order to gain it or to keep it. It can be lost. But it's always been a huge problem, even before it was called Arminian theology. Arminian theology has been around since the days of Jesus. Jesus himself said in Matthew chapter 7 that most that would come in his name would believe and teach that we're saved by Christ plus works. This circle, these two circles represent a proportion of what I think Jesus was talking about. Those that believe the true gospel are under siege of those that believe and teach a different gospel. Jesus said that most that come in his name would teach that different gospel. So those circles represent that the gospel has been under siege since even uh, the prophecy of Jesus in Matthew chapter 7. But as you know, there are many many other movements that have uh, arisen, especially in the last 40 years. And I say 40 years, it's a significant number that I'll refer to later in the message. But the last 40 years, we've seen a surge in other movements, many more than I'll mention, but I'll just refer to three. These are all that you're familiar with. First, Reformed theology. The teaching that someone must have good works in their lives to prove that they have eternal life. The word believe is redefined as commit or repent. Someone who embraces this teaching will never know if they've done enough, and they won't know until they die. This movement, this theology, is growing enormously in popularity, even among and especially among a younger generation. Uh, My son is involved in college ministry in a church in College Station, and he just uh, keeps me updated on the fact that this uh, movement is just spreading like wildfire among the younger generation. Of course, the younger generation also embraces what I would refer to as postmodern theology. This is the theology that teaches you can't know anything for certain. If the word believe means I'm convinced that it's true, postmodern theology has a hard time embracing even the term believe. To be convinced that something true is, is true is not the mindset of postmodern theology. And as many of you know, this again is a huge uh, sweeping movement among the younger generation to think in postmodern theological terms. And then a final one that I want to mention is here and now theology. That's in quotation marks. I don't know if there's an official title to that theology. It's just what I call it. A focus on life now, not life hereafter. That the focus is on seeking God's help in life, wanting to experience God in our daily life. Not that there is not a belief in everlasting life, is just not talked about very much. It's just not the emphasis of what the church or the movement is talking about. And this, again, is an enormously popular popular uh, movement that we have seen arisen in the last uh, 40 years, especially even more so in the last 10 years. Now, we could add to this list, these are four of the biggest movements, in my opinion, biggest theologies that are keeping the gospel under siege. Again, the gospel has been under siege for centuries, but it's especially been under siege, in my opinion, in the last 40 years. In fact, look at the size of the inner circle, and I want to represent just uh, in the, watch what happens to the, to the inner circle. I think it's getting smaller in proportion to the outer circle. Now, at this point, I want to refer to something. I could have developed this more today, but I just refer to something that uh, hope, hopefully you're aware of. 
the evangelical church is in steep decline, and it has been especially in the last uh, 10 years or so. I ran across a book last summer called The Fall of the Evangelical Nation by Christine Wicker. She was a, the religion writer of the Dallas Morning News for many years. Many of you may be familiar with her name. She wrote this book, and I, for some time I was referring to it, even after I read it, The Decline of the Evangelical Nation. And every time I go back and say, is that what the title of that book was? No, it's her, she titled it The Fall of the Evangelical Nation. There's a big difference between titling the book Decline of the Evangelical Nation and The Fall of the Evangelical Nation. And when I read the book, it just it was just shocking to me as she very accurately uh, did research and documented all of her research uh, on the statistical movement of the evangelical groups in the United States, not just the denominations, but the independent churches as well. And her conclusion, her not just her conclusion, her evidence shows that the evangelical church is in steep decline, especially because of what's happening in the younger generation. George Barna uh, has written extensively on this in a number of books as well. You're familiar with George Barna, I'm sure. He points out that the church, the evangelical church, is in steep decline, numerically speaking, and it's especially true, it's just multiplied true among the younger generation. It's a crisis situation as we see the inner circle on that diagram getting smaller. The gospel has always been under siege, but it's especially under siege in our generation. Now, I want to talk more about the condition of the inside circle, not just the numbers, but the heart. Jesus said of the church at Laodicea, you are lukewarm. Now, you may hold to the eight, uh, seven churches as being ages of the history of the church. I don't know. I think uh, that's possible. If so, it's been suggested that we're living in the Laodicean age. Whether we believe that or not, I think it's safe to say that the church today has a Laodicean character. Whether we want to talk about that as uh, God intended that to be, this is the Laodicean age, I don't know. But I do think it's safe to say that the church today is lukewarm in terms of its passion for Christ and its passion for a lost world. So again, as we look at the circles and consider the condition of the inside circle, those that believe and embrace the saving message, I think it's safe to say that uh, God's looking at a serious problem today. The gospel is under siege uh, as, uh, in, in an alarming way. And when we compare that diagram with the one I put up earlier about the increasing, the explosion of the world's population, we see that uh, God's dealing with a, a huge problem when we realize that he loves the world and desires all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. I want to combine those last two diagrams on this diagram. There's the population of the world. The, uh, the biggest circle on the inside represents those that embrace a different gospel. The circle on the, uh, in the middle represents those that embrace the true gospel, free grace gospel. And this next diagram shows what I've tried to demonstrate has happened in recent years if you watch the size of the circles. The world population has exploded, while the inner circle representing the condition, not only the numbers, but the condition of the church has shrunk. I want to see that again. Watch the movement. Now, as we look at that, that's pretty, uh, pretty discouraging, isn't it? So, uh, we could be very discouraged and feel very pessimistic about the situation in the world and the future of the free grace movement. But I want to say today that uh, God's got it all in control. He's got a plan. He's going to do something very dramatic 
to change what's represented in that diagram. God hasn't changed a bit in terms of his love for the world. God, our Savior, desires all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. And because of that, here's what he's going to do. We live in a time now where the gospel is under siege, but on a given day, perhaps soon, the rapture of the church will occur as represented by the arrow going up, where the church will be taken out of the world, and then there will be a time of worldwide evangelism such as the world has never seen or ever will see during the tribulation period, seven-year tribulation period. God's just going to start over. He's going to take the church out of the world and start over. Now, here's what I think the conditions look like now. And at the moment of the rapture, watch that inside circle. Here's what's going to happen at the very moment of the rapture. Right? At a given moment of time, there won't be anybody on the earth that is a believer in Jesus Christ. But that won't last long. In fact, I think it will only last for seconds or minutes. Because immediately after the rapture, God is going to raise up two witnesses in the city of Jerusalem. And he says of them in Revelation 11.3, I will give power to my two witnesses and they will prophesy 1,000 260 days. To put it in the timeline, the two witnesses will minister during the first half of the tribulation period. He says of these two witnesses, these are two olive trees and the two lampstands standing before the God of the earth. Now, as lampstands, that means they are light. Certainly, that would represent, they represent the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ. They will proclaim the gospel from the city of Jerusalem. And as olive trees, that means they have plenty of oil to keep those lights, those lamps, shining brightly. I believe the two witnesses are going to proclaim the true free grace message. I don't, I'm, I don't just, I believe it, I'm convinced that it's true. I know it's true. They will preach the same message that we read in the words of Jesus in the Gospel of John. And uh, they will get people's attention. They will have power to strike the earth with all plagues as often as they desire. That will get people's attention to say maybe these guys have something to say that we need to listen to. So they themselves will have a great impact when it comes to evangelism. But that impact will especially be seen in Jerusalem. In, in Jerusalem and the nation of Israel. We read that 144,000 of all the tribes of the children of Israel were sealed. Of course, these refer to the 144,000 Jewish evangelists that will be saved at the beginning of the tribulation as a result of the testimony of the two witnesses. And uh, during the last half of the tribulation, the 144,000 will go out all over the earth to spread the free grace message, the message that those that believe in Jesus Christ for eternal life have it. In Revelation chapter 7, where we read of the 144,000, we're told the outcome or the fruit of their ministry in verse 9. After these things I looked, and behold, a great multitude, which no one could number, of all nations, tribes, tongues, and peoples, Verse 14, these are the ones who come out of the great tribulation and washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Now, those verses tell us that the worldwide evangelism that occurs during the great tribulation is just going to be enormously successful in terms of uh, its effect. A number that no one could count, a great number that no one could number of all the nations, all the tribes, all the peoples, all the tongues. These are the people that are saved during the tribulation. That passage is increasingly becoming one of my favorite passages in all the Bible. I'm just so excited every time I think about it, about this great uh, harvest of souls during the tribulation. But it will be because of the 
work of the Jewish evangelists, the two witnesses and the 144,000. And it's another fulfillment of the promise that God made to Abraham when he said, I will bless those who bless you. I will curse him who curses you. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Through the Jewish people, the two witnesses, the 144,000 in particular, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. What greater blessing could they receive than to hear the gospel clearly proclaimed to them in a way that they understand and believe. What we're reading is the fulfillment of what Jesus said in Matthew 24, 14. This gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations, and then the end will come, referring to the worldwide evangelism that occurs during the tribulation. It helps us to even better understand why Paul said this about the Jewish people. Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they may be saved. Certainly, Paul's heart was for the salvation of the Jews. And Paul zealously prayed for the salvation of the Jews. But when we understand the whole picture, we realize that Paul was praying for the salvation of the Jews, not just for the salvation of the Jews, but for the salvation of those that the saved Jews would reach on a future day. Paul was the apostle to the Gentiles and a lover of the Gentiles. But Paul knew that the greatest fruit among the Gentiles would come when the Jews were first saved and then took that message to the Gentiles as they will during the tribulation. Now, as we look at this verse, I think this verse is not just saying, well, that's something that we learn about Paul. Paul said, be imitators of me. If there's one thing that I think uh, I want to imitate of Paul and that I would encourage us all to imitate about Paul, it's what we read about Paul in this verse. That one of the greatest um, passions of our heart should be for the salvation of the Jews. And one of the greatest desires in our life would be that we would give ourselves to prayer for the salvation of the Jews. You know, Jesus said, pray to the Lord of the harvest that he would raise up laborers for the harvest. What better laborers could we pray that God will one day raise up than the two witnesses and the 144,000? Because there will be no greater uh, fruit of world evangelism than when those people are involved in that effort. God, our Savior, desires all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. Nowhere will that be evidenced and realized more than in the worldwide evangelism of the tribulation. Now, I want you to think about this. I want to take this another step. Because of God's heart for the world, we need to think today that this gospel under siege may not continue much longer. God seems to have set the stage for the salvation of the Jews and evangelization by the Jews by fulfilling a specific prophecy of Jesus not very long ago. The prophecy is found in uh, Luke 21. Jesus said, When you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, then know that its desolation is near. And they will fall by the edge of the sword and be led away captive into all nations. And Jerusalem will be trampled by Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. Repeating verse 24 with a different background. Jerusalem will be trampled by Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. Repeating that again with another background. Jerusalem will be trampled by Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. That picture is a picture taken in June of 1967 on the day that the Jewish people regained control of the city of Jerusalem for the first time since 70 A.D. Jerusalem had been trampled underfoot by the Gentiles since 70 A.D. until that day in 1967. It's the first time since 70 A.D. that sovereignty over the old city of Jerusalem was regained by the Jewish people. And the prophecy of Jesus says that that's the day that the times of the Gentiles were fulfilled. 
And this relates very much to the future of the great free grace movement, as I'm about to try to explain. What I want to do now is share some things I learned from Zane Hodges about the significance of this event as it relates to uh, what I've shared with you thus far. I want to use this timeline uh, to focus on um, the times of the Gentiles and its significance. Times of the Gentiles began in 70 A.D. when Jerusalem was trampled underfoot by the Gentiles, as Jesus predicted. The times of the Gentiles ended in 1967 when Jerusalem was regained. The end of the times of the Gentiles was announced in 1967. Jerusalem was no longer under control of the Gentiles, and God's focus upon the salvation of Gentiles and evangelism by the Gentiles changed. Up until or during the times of the Gentiles, Gentiles were in the forefront of God's program, not Jerusalem or the Jews. But Zane said this to me. I took careful notes as he spoke. 1967 is a signal that the period of evangelism by the Gentiles is basically over. 1967 is a signal that the church age is about over. Now, looking uh, what happened after what has happened and will happen after 1967, if the times of the Gentiles ended in 67, then we must be living in the times of the Jews today. Now, we know that the tribulation certainly is the times of the Jews. But the time from 67 leading up to the tribulation would also be referred to as the times of the Jews since the times of the Gentiles ended in 67. I'll say more about this in a moment. What I want to do now is go back to what was occurring before the times of the Gentiles and focus on the stoning of Stephen in 33 AD. Stephen's stoning was the final indictment of the Jewish nation. Jewish unbelief was evident, as well as a legalistic spirit, even among believers, in, even among the Jewish believers in Jerusalem. Now, the times of the Gentiles didn't begin until 70 A.D., but from 33 to 70, Jews were being saved, but God had turned his attention to the Gentiles. In other words, before the times of the Gentiles began, God had already turned his attention toward the Gentiles. Um, it's an example that God turns his attention elsewhere while a previous program is continuing. Before the times the Gentiles began, God turned his attention to the Gentiles. That's analogous, uh, let me go back, to what uh, we see happening today in anticipation of the tribulation period. In the tribulation, we know, we know that God's focus will be on Jerusalem and the Jews. But think about it. Since 1967, God's focus has already turned toward the Jews and the city of Jerusalem. The focus of the world today is on sorting out the results of the Six-Day War, and the focus of the world today is on who's going to control Jerusalem. It's the major issue that the world keeps coming back to. God is working today to prepare for the days of the tribulation. He's working today to prepare for the salvation of the Jews, which will result in worldwide evangelism by the Jews. To put it another way, he's turned his attention to the Jews even before the church age has ended. And I want to quote uh, specifically uh, some words from Zane, almost verbatim as I wrote as he shared this with me. The church has increasingly lost its focus on the gospel of grace since 1967. And the logarithmic increase in world population is outstripping a reasonable opportunity to reach the world with the gospel. Let me repeat that. The logarithmic increase in world population is outstripping a reasonable opportunity to reach the world with the gospel. The number of people who are dying unsaved is increasing greatly every day. God will put limits on this. 
there has to be a point where the delay would cause more and more people to be lost. So we've considered the biblically prophesied future of the free grace movement. The future is bright. It's very good. We live in a day where the gospel is under siege, and God's aware of that, but God has great plans for the future. Worldwide evangelism during the tribulation through the two witnesses and the 144,000 in particular. And we've seen three reasons why this day may be coming soon. The logarithmic increase of the world population, the present condition of the church, the gospel is under siege, and a specific event that occurred in 1967 when the times of the Gentiles were fulfilled. The future is good. God desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. God is going to take dramatic steps to fulfill his heart's desire for the nations of the world during the tribulation. Grace people like you and me should be saying today, this is the most exciting day to be alive. Thank God for the privilege of being alive in this day. And of all people, grace people like you and me, should be praying for the salvation of the Jews more than anybody in this world. Specifically for the raising up of the two witnesses and the 144,000. And for the salvation of the multitudes from every nation that will hear the gospel and believe during the tribulation. And grace people of all people should be taking advantage of the opportunity that God gives us. If these are the last days of the church age, what a great privilege we have of still lifting up the message of the grace of God to those that desperately need to hear it. Would you stand with me as we pray together in light of uh, these truths? <clears throat> Father, thank you that in the midst of living in a world where the gospel is under siege, that you've reminded us of the great future that lies ahead, that you have not lost your love for the world and your heart for the world, that you will move as you've been moving in a powerful and dramatic way to set the stage for worldwide evangelism during the tribulation. Father, it could be that these two witnesses are alive today. Whether they are or are not, we pray that you would raise them up, prepare them. We pray for the day that the eyes of their heart will be opened and they will believe in Jesus for eternal life and spread and proclaim the message of the gospel of grace as it will be heard all over the world. We pray that you be preparing the 144,000 Jews that will believe and in turn spread the message to every nation. And we pray that you'd be preparing, be preparing the nations to hear that message during the tribulation and for the multitudes that will be saved. We long for that day to come. We pray for the effect of the worldwide evangelism on a future day. Father, we pray that uh, you would use us today. What a great day it is to be alive. We thank you for the privilege of being alive today. And may we be faithful to the opportunity that you've given us to proclaim the message of Christ to a world that desperately needs to hear it. Amen. Okay, thank you. Be seated. All right, uh, questions, I guess, on cards. In your list of different Gospels, where do you see Lordship, Salvation, under Reformed Theology?
The verses in Luke 21, 25 to 28 seem to indicate the times of Gentiles will end at the second coming. During the tribulation, the Gentiles will occupy the holy city for 42 months when Antichrist reigns from the city of Jerusalem. Well, I think that the passage itself defines... uh, I think Jesus defined it within the passage itself. He prophesied the destruction in 70 A.D. And Jerusalem was trampled by Gentiles from 70 A.D. until clearly 1967. So when Jerusalem is no longer trampled by Gentiles, then that the times the Gentiles end. It is true that there, there will be Gentiles occupying during the tribulation, but that's obviously during the times of the Jews because... The tribulation is the time of the Jews. So it's a different, uh, it's a whole different set of terms and categories and circumstances. Your list of, okay, I read that one. The, to say the church has Laodicean character, is this true of the church worldwide or is it true of the North American context? That's a good question. I I think only God could answer that. Uh, Probably it's more true of North America than than other places. That's why I'm uh, I'm not uh, insistent that we're living in a Laodicean age. We may, as a church age, or as one of the stages of the church, we may be, I, I don't know. If it is not for Christ's disciples to know the things the Father put in his own authority, why are we speculating about it? If it's not for Christ's disciples to know the things... uh, I don't know that I've speculated about anything, but if I have, I guess you'd have to tell me. I don't know. I didn't set a date. Zane never set a date for the rapture, and I didn't either. Okay. And uh, Zane wouldn't do that. I wouldn't do that. Um... Just saying we're getting closer. God is certainly setting the stage for the end time events. How could we not say that? Okay. The Gentiles still, to this day, control the Temple Mount. Dome of the Rock continues to dominate the Jerusalem skyline. How can the times of the Gentiles be over when these things are true? Well, the Jews are sovereignly over the city of Jerusalem. They have allowed the Muslims to operate the Temple Mount or to have uh, control, I guess, practical control of the Temple Mount, but the Jews are sovereign over the whole city. The only reason the Muslims are allowed to do that is because the, the state of Israel allows them to. The following verses in the... Okay, I read that one. I need to set aside the ones I've read. Would you share again the three reasons the rapture may be soon? Um, the increase of the world population. And I think Zane said it so well. Let me read uh, those words again. The logarithmic increase in world population is outstripping a reasonable opportunity to reach the world with the gospel. The number of people who die unsaved is increasing greatly every day. God will put limits on this. There has to be a point where the delay would cause more to be lost. Will God let the world population just keep, that chart just keep going up and up and up with the church not even beginning to keep up with that? Or will God step in and say, time to change that? Uh, Let's see, the other was the uh, times of the Gentiles. Gospel under siege, that's, those are two. World population, gospel under siege, and uh, the fulfillment of the times of Gentiles prophecy. Where does it state that the 144,000 are evangelists? It's the connection in um, Revelation 7. It, just, it talks about the 144,000, and then it talks about the world, the multitudes that are saved during the tribulation. I think those are together to show that this is the here's 144,000 and this is the outcome of what 144,000 do 
If the time of the Gentiles is over, who are the Palestinians? Again, they don't have... Uh, well, the Palestinians... I guess the implication here is, why are the Palestinians in the land? It's not about who's in the land. It's about who is sovereign over the land and who is sovereign over the city, specifically. Uh, the city of Jerusalem. Israel gained sovereignty over the city of Jerusalem, in uh, the old city of Jerusalem in 1967. I, I see your representation as a complete demotivation for evangelism because the Jews will do it for us. <laughs> well, sorry that you feel that way. I, to me, it's, it's just... The Jews are an encouragement to me. I mean, what, what God's going to do through the Jews is an encouragement, a motivation to me to want to be like them, to want to have courage and conviction to step out into a world, hostile world. I mean, it's going to be, uh, you know, you know what's going to happen to the two witnesses. They're going to be put to death. The uh, Jewish, the 144,000 aren't going to find it easy, as uh, Jesus implied in uh, Matthew 25. They will have a hard time finding food, shelter, clothing. Some people will help them. Uh, but they stand up in the midst of great opposition from the beast and uh, proclaim the message faithfully. What, what greater examples for evangelism could we have than the, uh, the Jewish evangelists? I mean, God's told us to be faithful in the life that he's given us. Uh, this is no, by no way implying that we shouldn't evangelize. That's our commission to evangelize and make disciples. Uh, I just think it's encouraging to know that uh, there's a great future ahead and that, uh, um, to me, it's, just, it's motivating. So I'm sorry that you feel that way. From the time of the captivity, Syrian and Babylon, especially Babylon, did the times of Gentiles begin or transition because of the fact no living and then they rejected the Messiah was this a long transition are the times of the Gentiles not Daniel's image well let me I can understand the last part Daniel's image talks about um, different Gentile dynasties that are prophesied you know through the ages but that's not equivalent to the times of the Gentiles. Daniel never referred to that as the times of the Gentiles. Times of the Gentiles is a technical term that Jesus used in Luke 21. So just because Daniel mentions Gentile uh, dynasties through the ages doesn't mean that that's the same as what Jesus referred to as the times of the Gentiles. He's got to stop. You're supposed to stop. Okay. Thank you.